Uh, welcome to the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners meeting for Wednesday, April 15th. Um, just a few notes as we get started. Uh, we were pretty excited about our successful Zoom meeting last week. Thanks to all that made that happen and we hope for the same this week. Um, however, we do ask that you be patient with us as we work through some of these technology challenges. A few reminders about how we're going to run our meeting in this time of stay at home and social distancing. First, if visual aids are used during the meeting, the presenter will share the screen with the call. Participants will not be able to view them without a computer, smartphone, or tablets. All participants will be entered into the meeting with their audio muted, meaning the commission and the public will not be able to hear you. Presenters will be unmuted when their agenda item comes up. And we ask that all online presenters use good conference call etiquette and mute their line when not speaking. Also, please introduce yourself each time you speak. If you have a public comment on the agenda item or um, have a public comment during our regular public comment section, we please ask that you use the raise your hand function on Zoom. Staff will call on you and unmute you. We ask that speakers give their name and address for the minutes. The county does reserve the right to shut off the microphone and remove any speaker from the meeting if they are vulgar, rude, or inappropriate. The chat function has been disabled and a recording of this meeting will be available on our website after the meeting. With that, I wanna welcome everybody and start with our consent agenda. We have four items on our consent agenda. Thank you for scrolling that down, Sarah. I have a, mo uh, does any uh, member of the commission have an item that they'd like to remove off the consent agenda? No, nope. Does any member of the public have an item that they would like removed off the consent agenda? Sarah and Jill are the ones who let us know if there is and there's not. All right, I would entertain a motion for consent agenda items one, two, three, and four. Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, we'll move now to our regular agenda. Our first item is item 2.1, which is the neighborhood revitalization area or NRA to construct a mixed use project at approximately 800 Pennsylvania Street. Uh, good evening, County Commissioners. This is Britt Crumpano. I'm the City Economic Development Administrator. And uh, Jill, I think, is helping me share my PowerPoint. I'm gonna make a brief presentation. We do have uh, the applicant and the applicant's representative here. I believe Diane Stoddard is also on the line. So um, after the presentation, we can open it up for questions if you'd like some additional information. Uh, but basically, I'm just gonna quickly go over what the project is, the request, the analysis, the considerations, um, recommendations, and then uh, requested action and next steps. I do want to point out that this uh, PowerPoint I've used at three meetings now, um, the school board district meeting on Monday, as well as the city commission meeting last night, some of these items on the request will not be um, of, of uh, interest or consideration to the county, and I'll let you know which ones those are. So basic, basically, it's everything except for the uh, NRA or neighborhood revitalization area. It's not um, a request of the county. So next, please. Uh, next, oh, thank you. Uh, so this is a mixed-use project. It's located in the East Lawrence Warehouse Arts District. Uh, first floor, it will be a combination of commercial retail office, also some live-work units, which are kind of a unique concept, which the applicant can uh, give you some more information on. Floors two through four are residential and a mix of different uh, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom, and then both on-site and off-site parking. Uh, next, please. Uh, the the um, residential on floors two through four are um, affordable housing. This project is participating in the low income housing tax credit uh, or LIHTC 
program. This is a federal program specifically to help advance affordable housing. And altogether, there'll be 47 affordable rental units. Next, please. So the request is for a 15 year, 95% neighborhood revitalization area. Uh, the, again, the additional requests were of the city, so I'm not gonna go over any of those. Uh, next, please. So just um, as uh, a recap, the neighborhood revitalization area is a property tax rebate program and it applies only to the incremental increase in value uh, due to the project. Uh, so the base property is shielded from the rebate. The base property is what the property was bringing in before improvements. This project will be built on three parcels and uh, the last tax statement for the three parcels, uh, altogether they were bringing in about $2,200 a year. Uh, so the, um, the taxing jurisdictions still get that base property tax and then any increment, whatever percentage of increment is not awarded, they would also um, get. Next, please. Uh, so here's just a visual of how, oops, thank you. <laughs> here's a visual of kind of how it all works. And th these were estimated uh, numbers for the 800 Pennsylvania Street project. The blue down at the bottom is the small base um, that the property is currently bringing in. The red indicates the amount uh, that the taxing jurisdictions will receive both during the, the rebate period and after. Um, I did want to point out, I only went out 20 years, uh, but real estate has a much longer life, of course, than that. So the long-term return is, is, uh, will be much more su su substantial um, if you looked at the real true life of the property. The green section uh, represents the rebate that the um, property owner receives to help them with this affordable housing project. Next, please. Next, next please. I'm sorry, my it's it's not going. It's going slowly. I'm sorry. That's there, okay. Is that right? Yeah, you can skip this one. This this also is not okay. uh, for, for the county. So you, you can go on. Uh, you can skip this screen as well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the benefit cost analysis or cost benefit analysis. I ran this two separate ways. Um, the um, the the request package is also asking for some funds from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and uh, that is not part of our economic development tools. So the first scenario shows how I would normally run the, the analysis. And as you can see there, the, uh, the ratios, the benefit cost ratios are all above the 1.25 threshold that the city prefers to see. Um, and then of course, down below, if you add in those affordable housing funds that the city would provide in the form of a grant, you can see the impact it has on the city ratio. Next, please. Um, National Development Council is our third party financial consultant when it comes to economic development projects. Uh, they did initial analysis and underwriting. Uh, they came to the uh, conclusion that the project uh, definitely needs all of uh, what they've requested in order to make it viable. Um, that is often, case, often, often the case with affordable housing projects. It does take a lot of um, capital stacking of different resources to make it all come together. Next, please. Uh, additional considerations. It meets the community's goal to increase affordable housing. Uh, it converts vacant parcels to productive use. It promotes the density and vibrancy within the East Lawrence Historic Warehouse District, and it supports infield development. Next, please. So staff feels that this uh, project meets uh, everything 
that is required for the NRA, uh, as well as the other items that they were requesting. Uh, again, the benefit cost ratio threshold is a uh, is above 1.25 for all the taxing jurisdictions. Uh, the affordable housing grant, when you throw that in there, it isn't, but uh, that's partly because the the model is not capturing intangible benefits uh, from those funds of bringing affordable housing to the community. Next, please. So Kirk reviewed this um, at their February 6th meeting and they voted four to one to recommend the approval of a 15 year 95% NRA. And they also approved uh, the rest of the request. Next, please. And although you guys aren't, aren't uh, necessarily concerned with the affordable housing grant funds, they also voted to recommend the package. Next, please. Uh, so for the city last night, they, uh, their action was to adopt on first reading the NRA ordinance 9738. And, uh, and they did, um, as well as they did, they did actually approve the rest of the package with the exception of the city fees. Next, please. So um, the school board considered this uh, on Monday, last, this past Monday, and they voted six to one to participate in the 15-year uh, 95% uh, NRA. The city commission met last night and considered it on first reading and they voted four to one to approve the 15-year uh, uh, 95% NRA. So it's now before you, the county commission, it will go back to the city commission on second reading and that is tentatively scheduled for um, next Tuesday, the 21st. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Appreciate that. Any questions for Britt while she's here? Okay. None from me. I don't have any. Thank you, Britt. Thanks. Thank you. And Patrick, I'm not seeing any on the panel or on the attendees. Any questions either? Okay. Probably hear from the applicant here. I guess that would be the right thing to do. I see Tony's here. Hey guys. Can you Patrick. Hear me? That's Patrick. Yeah. yeah. Hi commissioners. Thank you for uh, for taking the time this evening. Um, I'm here to answer any questions uh, that you may have. If you wanted a, another overview, I'm happy to do that as well. I think Britt did a, a great job, but let me let me know if if you need anything from me. Appreciate that. Um, I'm fairly familiar with this project, having seen it at the Affordable Housing Advisory Board and at FERC. So um, I'm gonna just check with my other two commissioners to see if they have any questions before we open it up for any public comment. I don't have any questions, Patrick. Thanks. Um, this is Nancy. I, I don't have any uh, any questions. I, I read the packet pretty carefully and um, have some background on the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. I have, it's kind of a side question, but there was one correspondence, um, Tony, from a fellow named John Thorberg who asked specifically about how you're going to um, take into consideration those folks with bikes and inside parking for bikes and all of that. I know that this is outside of the, of the uh, tonight's decision, but um, had you received that correspondence or that request for attention to that? I can't, I can't say that I have. I, uh, I still have the bad habit of reading the comments section in the newspaper. Um, so I, I saw some, some comments today, but none about bikes. Um, I, I, might, uh, okay. I, might make, I might make mention, Commissioner Thelman, uh, that we did that uh, at the Polar Lofts, that we have indoor as mm -hmm. well as uh, 
is outdoor bike racks. Um, this might have changed, but I don't, I'm not sure if the indoor bike racks um, were used as much as the outdoor, maybe in that situation because you had to go down a flight of stairs or down the elevator. Um, but um, but I, I will say as somebody that likes to bike myself, uh, it would be nice. On the other hand, it does take up quite a bit of valuable square footage. And from an amenity uh -huh. standpoint, um, we, we've already made our commitments uh, to the state and to the city. So I, I, I never want to tell anybody no, um, but in, uh -huh. in reality, I'm not sure how much physical space we might have to, to do something like that. Okay, well, I appreciate your um, thoughts on that. I might just, since you haven't seen it, I might just send that correspondence along to you so you can be aware of it at least and, and, and keep it in mind. And I apologize, I know that's kind of outside of our uh, real decision tonight, but I thought you would want to know about that one. Yeah, one thing that we're uh, taking a look at doing, and, and this is at our office building uh, in Prairie Village, but there's, a, there's not only a bike rack system, but there's also a little toolkit attached to it and might maybe even an air pump attached to it. So that's something that we had already been thinking about doing on the north side of the building, uh, mm -hmm. so long that we can get permitting to do so. And that would not only be an amenity for our tenants at uh, Penn Street Lofts, but also an amenity for the Warehouse Arts District and East Lawrence, um, in addition to mm -hmm. just our tenants which is why we wanted it to be on the north side so that it was accessible and that people saw it and knew about it, that they didn't, you know, have to know that it's, you know, behind the building where most people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't find it visible. So. Right. Right. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Otherwise I'm, I don't have any questions. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Thelman. Uh, this is a public agenda item, so we'll open it up to see if, well, all of our agenda items are public, um, but this is a regular business item, so we'll open it up for public comment at this time. Uh, Sarah or Jill? Nope, not seeing anything. Okay, I'm not hearing from Sarah, so I'm going to assume we don't have anybody at the county commission building right now wanting to give public comment on this there's no public comment sorry about that thank you um, so we'll bring it back up to the commission for conversation motions and a vote and i i guess i'll just start i i am excited about this project um i think you know Britt said that we we don't we do follow very closely our affordable housing goals and really care a whole lot about them and, and I think we want to provide more affordable housing in the county and so that was something that checked the box for me. Um, also, um, the benefit analysis. This is really a, it's what you want on these types of projects in my mind. Um, you you know, there could be the argument made that that neighborhood is very well developed already. Um, I, I think this really kind of completes the puzzle for us over there. Um, I really appreciate all the work Tony has done to bring in the outside funding um, to leverage on this project. And, and I'm, I'm excited to support it. So this is um, this is Nancy and I. Um, I I would echo um, Patrick's thoughts. I think our our new comprehensive plan calls for um, infill development, especially around downtown, and uh, equitable um, treatment uh, for folks. And this provides a way for um, folks with low income and the need for affordable housing still to live. Uh, very near a very desirable um, part of town. Um, the neighborhood plan calls for medium uh, dense residential in that uh, on that particular corner. So this fits. And um, in terms of the 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 numbers to have uh, over eight million dollars leveraged about outside money for this purpose and a relatively small. Um, 
ask of uh, for city dollars and certainly uh, the promise of real return on the dollar in terms of tax revenue uh, at the end of the abatement is um, it's really uh, it's a strong project and um, I, I think it's something that actually in the midst of the situation we're in with the COVID-19 and um, the potential for uh, fewer projects coming our way. Uh, I think that we, you know, I think this is a good project to, to go with now while we can uh, with that many millions of dollars leveraged in our favor and a real need for affordable units. Uh, and a developer who's willing to be committed to affordable housing. I think it's, it's a win-win and I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to support it. And without repeating everything that uh, my fellow commissioner said, I, I too, I mean, there's just so many benefits and pluses to this project, um, you know, yeah, we all know that there's a need, so I'm very supportive of it. Okay, so I'll go ahead and make the motion, if it's all right with my fellow commissioners, to um, receive the recommendation from the Public Incentive Advisory Committee and consider county participation in a 15-year, 95% neighborhood revitalization area in RA for County Kirsch to construct a mixed use project at approximately 800 Pennsylvania Street. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. Thank you, Britt. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our second item is for bids for a for the courthouse and JLE parking lot repairs. And, um, we got a little bit of a preview of this last week, if you were tuning in to our meeting then. And uh, David Sparks, is David here? Actually, uh, Commissioner Kelly, this is Sarah Plinsky. Um, Dave, uh, Dave's had a hard time getting in on the Zoom call, so I said I would help uh, cover this item for him. I think Keith Browning is available as well. Um, and you have some specific questions on the bids. I would say that this is a project that we have had a part of our special building plan for a number of years. Um, it has been a project that we've um, sort of struggled with because it would mean closing down our parking lots, um, which as, as most folks know are very busy uh, during normal times um, and full of uh, employees and visitors to both the courthouse and the judicial and law enforcement center. Um, Maintenance uh, and public works staff uh, felt like this was an excellent opportunity to, um, to, to jump on an opportunity to go ahead and get this uh, project completed. Um, the bids were sent to you. I think Dave is on now if you have questions for him. Um, and uh, we, the funds are budgeted in the special building fund to complete this project. Any questions for Dave or for Sarah? I don't have any questions. Uh, I don't either. Okay, so this is a, a, a regular agenda item and we open those up for public comment. Is there any public comment, Sarah or Jill? There's no public comment here. Okay. No, I don't see any, sorry. Okay, thanks, Joe. All right, so if there's no public comment, commissioners, motions or comments? I think Patrick, didn't we, we have uh, Dave's recommendation for a specific um, company now, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, Kilo. I believe that's it. I'm just having trouble getting to numbers, but I would, um, I'd be happy to try and make the motion um, to uh, award a construction contract for repairs to the courthouse and JLE parking lots 
uh, and to North Street uh, for the uh, bid submitted by Kilo. And I think the bid amount, if I can amend your motion, Commissioner Thalsman, is one. 49 is that correct Dave? I can try to get to the item. That is correct. Okay. Okay, that would be my motion. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Dave. I'm Glad you got on finally to put in your two cents worth. Appreciate that. Okay, on to the next item, which is for the creation of Douglas County Consolidated Fire District Number One, merging fire districts one, four, and six. All right. Commissioners, I will kick this off and then turn it over to Cami Owens, uh, who I believe is yeah is on the call. Um, I just as you know, we talked about this last week that this um, uh, that this resolution was going to be on our agenda this week um, to begin the process, and really this is the beginning of of this of the second step uh, to consolidate the existing districts together. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Cammy to give any just sort of high level comments and, and then I'll available for any questions the commissioners might have. Thanks, Sarah. Um, good evening. This is Cammy Owens, Douglas County Budget Manager. Um, we are presenting the resolution for the beginning of the second phase of our fire districts that um, we have been working on for the past, uh, looks like since March. Um, mm -hmm. This is just to create the merger. Um, the next step would be that there would be final action after there's been time for a protest petition uh, to allow for a protest petition um, on June 24th. So this is just the beginning and to put publications out there that this is our intention to merge all three of these. I will tell you that um, originally we had thought that we were going to keep the number six and make this fire district number six since that was the created um, fire district. But uh, Douglas County currently has fire districts two and three, and it seems kind of odd to not have one, two, and three. So we discussed it amongst all the members and the legal counsel. And um, for clarification, we wanna call it consolidated fire district number one. And then we will have fire districts number one, two, and three in Douglas County. Thanks, Cammie. And I just wanna add a couple other things. You know, this is, uh, we had a uh, work session, I believe on this topic um, on early in March, where we talked about a number of the benefits of uh, this, this plan. Um, and, uh, you know, really it's about efficiency and service provision and making sure that residents of the unincorporated area continue to be protected and have access to these important life-saving services. Um, Cami and I have been having uh, ongoing conversations with Chief Baxter about the project and, um, and, and preparing the budget. So I do believe like we, we will bring back before you as a part of our budget process what our intention is for the budget for this district. Um, and I've seen some preliminary information on the budget and we do believe that we can uh, create a budget uh, inside the what we announced up front as the anticipated levy of 5.5 mils. Uh, uh, commissioners know from last week we have received letters of support from each of the townships and di uh, districts for this uh, process. Um, so at this point in time, uh, you know, while we are um, going through the process to formally uh, consolidate uh, everyone together, we will continue to be working really hard behind the scenes to, to pull everything together to create the process. And to that end, uh, um, I will be working closely with Chief Baxter to create the transition team and establish his leadership over the district. 
as well as then formally putting together the transition team that's been working really informally at this point in time um, to on questions and, and um, um, you know, other things concerning what we need to do to create the district there. Are, like, like we said on March 4th, there are thousands of little details on this when you, as you pull groups together that have been working separately. So uh, I'll be in communication with the commission as we get that group together and if concerns are brought forward um, for us to proceed with this project. But uh, again, I would like to just thank the townships and the fire districts for their um, desire to do this, um, make this important step and uh, really look towards the future of uh, fire service in Douglas County. Do you all have any questions for me? I do not. I don't. I don't. I think we heard a lot about this at our study session quite a, you know, seems like a long time ago now. It really wasn't that long ago, but boy, it seems like a long time ago now. And, yep. and I, I would just say I appreciate some of the members of the public who brought up some questions and I think they're fair questions to ask, but you know, we're, we're early on in this process and, and uh, want to give it time and give the public time to sort of work this, work this through. So um, let's see if there are any, um, oh, we do have Mike Baxter. Uh, Mike, do you have any comments you wanted to make? Sorry, Commissioner, I was trying to get off you. Uh, yeah, this is Mike Baxter with Walker's Township Fire Department. And no, I, I do not have any comments that I would like to add to uh, what, um, the county administrator and Cami have said. So I just thank you guys for your support and working with us through this. Um, I think it's a, a huge step for the efficiency um, in the safety of not only the firefighters, but uh, the efficiency of services given to the, um, the community that uh, we serve. So uh, thank you for that support. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have members of the public. Is anyone wanting to provide public comment on this item? I don't I have no, see anything. If I have no public comment here. Okay. Just remember, folks, if you want to make public comment, raise your hand and we'll get you moved right in there. Okay. So with no public comment, um, any motions? I can make a motion, I can try. Um, so I would um, move to approve a resolution to form Douglas County Consolidated Fire District number one. Second. Moved and seconded. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, Cammie. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Baxter. Thank you, Sarah. And the last item on our regular agenda is a request to provide funding for school age feeding program with Lawrence Restaurants. I believe, Jill, you're our person on this one. Yes, commissioners. Um, this request emerged um, with um, a recommendation first from uh, the Unified Command um, response group, uh, uh, which is the, so it came before Sarah, Craig Owens with the city of Lawrence, Dan Partridge with the uh, Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority and um, uh, Russ Johnson from um, LMH Hospital. And the request came out of, as in my role, along with um, Derek Rogers from the city of Lawrence, um, we're, we're the co-conveners of the housing and human services branch of the unified command structure. Um, so as, I think you all know we've been convening um, three different work groups over the past uh, three weeks, four weeks. Um, I'm, I'm losing track of time. Um, one of those work groups is related to um, food distribution and feeding operations. So as we've convened um, a very large group of stakeholders um, 
under the leadership in that subgroup of Elizabeth Kieber of Just Food, um, we've been having what we th we believe to be just an ongoing conversation monitoring the needs, the community feeding needs and operations to make sure that we're getting those folks the resources they need, that we're sustaining operations at the level that they need um, and all that. Um, excuse me, um, sorry. Um, so this need came out, um, came up um, fairly recently um, as a result of a conversation or a decision that was made by the uh, Lawrence School District to cease their feeding operations, um, their school breakfast and lunch operations um, for um, beginning this week through May 1st. Um, and that was a response to what they believed to be were um, some challenges they had with the staff that was administering their programs at the different school sites. Um, so then an opportunity arose um, with the uh, members of the Lawrence Restaurant Association under the leadership of um, Emily, I am forgetting Emily's name right now, but Emily with Merchants. Peterson. Peterson. Yeah, Emily, I apologize. Emily Peterson with Merchants Pub and Plate and, um, and her role on behalf of the Lawrence Restaurant Association to organize efforts of interested restaurants to contribute their um, time and talents um, that could, uh, to, prov could to fill that gap um, of what they thought was an important, um, an important resource that was being provided to um, the children and of the Lawrence School District. Um, well, especially when we heard numbers along the lines of um, on a daily basis, 2,600 meals were being distributed. Um, so that includes breakfast and lunch at all four sites. Um, and that in um, the minds of folks that were a part of that conversation seemed like a compelling need and something that needed to be supported and sustained um, uh, given the, um, just the, the overall state of things. So the request that um, is before you has been facilitated also by efforts by the um, Lawrence Chamber um, and just so, man, so much time and energy by Hugh Carter. Um, combined with the uh, Lawrence Education Foundation, who's gonna act as the fiscal agent um, for this request. And they will, once they re receive a portion, uh, the portion of this um, uh, gap funding that's been requested of the city and the county, that 87,000, um, they will facilitate the payment of invoices for the contributing restaurants so that they can um, quickly continue to meet this need and, um, also, while also uh, adhering to the USDA, USD 497 um, guidelines um, for um, the very strict parameters about what can and can't be served and the nutrition guidelines and um, all in hopes of getting a reimbursement on the expenses to the fullest amount. That being said, the gap of funding that could not, that would not be uh, reimbursable to um, accommodate the needs of the restaurants and make it so they're not doing this at a loss. Um, that's the request that's before, before you all today. Um, the Lawrence Education Foundation um, has believe, or has already indicated that they'll be able to con, um, offset that amount by $25,000. And I believe that they have already applied for an additional $25,000 grant through the Kansas Health Foundation. Um, and then we recently learned today that um, there will be FEMA funding available um, to help um, offset these expenses even further with the goal being that this $87,000 total amount um, or the half that will be the city's, or the city's contribution and the half of that 87 that will be the county's contribution, that that will shrink um, considerably if get down to zero um, based on those FEMA dollars that are applied and any dollars that the Lawrence Education Foundation is able to garner to offset that expense. So that was kind of a long-winded ex um, <laughs> And today was the first day of doing it and it went really well, um, really well. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and apologize for all the rambling. <laughs> Hey, uh, Jill, this is Nancy. I don't um, have any questions and I actually needed all of that rambling because now yeah. it makes a lot more sense to me. Um, kind of, yeah, thank you. Uh, where bits and pieces of the um, 
money will come from in terms of um, making the city and the county whole if possible in the end. Um, I think uh, besides the fact that this is a way to feed our uh, kids in Douglas County, I think it's, um, I, I guess it, in Lawrence, um, it's also a way to keep our, uh, some of our restaurants um, busy doing what they love to do and keeping helping them keep their employees uh, working. So I'm right. I'm I'm glad for that as well, and and super grateful to Emily Peterson always for her leadership in in these kind of thoughtful, uh, much needed and thoughtful um, additions to all of the work that. Um, everyone's doing so yeah, thank you for mentioning that nancy that was one of the things i was going to add to jill's comments is that uh really this is a program that has two benefits for us in, in addition to uh over 1300 kids continuing to get food on a daily basis um, um the lawrence restaurant association this is really a little stimulus package for them in terms of being mm -hmm. able financially support them during this time. Um, so it's going to provide a little stimulus to them as well. And uh, so there's, it's got two benefits in that regard. Uh, like Jill said, we, we fully, in addition to the sources of funds she listed, uh, we also believe that perhaps the city's either CDBG or ESG funds would be able to be used to offset this, but that guidance just isn't out just yet. And, and most of those programs are reimbursements anyway. So uh, we, would, we need to proceed with the program and we need to proceed with um, incurring the expenses as a community in hopes that we are fully um, reimbursed. And then I would add that this is a program that uh, we really envision happening for a short period of time. Um, and that over the, by May 1st, so over the next few weeks, um, Jill and her leadership with the team of Liz Kiever and others will continue to work to begin to plan what will happen after May 1st, how the district can be engaged in that work, how we can, um, how we can uh, kind of try to get back to a better reimbursement model rate and uh, how we can work with our community, you know, organizations, restaurants and feeding partners to continue to feed folks throughout this event. Yeah, and I'll just offer that, um, you know, we, uh, we continue to monitor um, um, the needs of, you know, I, I feel like Liz Kiever and Just Food are they're kind of the hub of so many wheels of food distribution and food supports in the community. They're doing so many things, supporting all the little food pantries um, and, uh, and, and even the, you know, the Trinity, um, the, the, the lunch operations, things like that. Um, so Liz and I um, are in pretty regular contact with one another. Um, and um, I feel like she knows when it's time to um, elevate um, any concerns that she has on her end, um, but she's just um, been um, a complete soldier <laughs> in all this, and um, we feel fairly confident about where we are today, especially with this supplemental support. Jill, can you just say for me again, you, you mentioned $25,000 in there. Is that coming from the school's foundation? Is that what you said? The school's foundation um, indicated out of their ICANN fund, I believe, that they that's where some of their initial commitment of $25,000 would come from to offset this amount. Um, and then um, they, uh, Dina Johnston from the foundation, had as of yesterday submitted a Kansas Health Foundation grant that were recently released for 20, another $25,000. So at, the, at this point, it sounds like at least $50,000 um, will be accounted for by the foundation based on their efforts. And I know she's looking at some additional grant funding efforts as well. And, um, and then Sarah mentioned the CDBG money and um, the FEMA dollars that um, we believe will further help us offset this expense. And the, and the public could donate to that ICANN fund as well, is that right? 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, I don't have a ready to go link for that right now, but um, we can certainly get it out there um, and promote it. If the school's not, if the foundation's not already doing it, um, I can work with Carrie to make sure that we're promoting that on our social media just as much. Yeah, just, you know, kudos to so many people on this. I mean, it's just so great to see so many people coming together. Uh, you mentioned Hugh Carter and, and Dina Johnston, because it doesn't sound like we're having to do any of the administrative work really on this. We're just providing a, a financial backstop, so to say. And it sounds like you're, you're sort of saying, um, you know, some of that's being taken care of or been committed already. Is that correct? It has, yeah. We're just going, we're helping to front load the efforts so that it's a real seamless, quick process for the restaurants to get the financial resources they need to, to do this and, and, and pay the, and keep paying their bills um, and keep providing 150 meals each day. That's the commitment that each r restaurant is doing right now and paying for things like pa the paper sacks and things like that. Um, and I did want to mention that hy V is providing all of the milk um, at cost to um, uh, finish off the requirements, those USDA requirements as well. And they were, they've been, they were a great partner in this as well. Patrick, I guess the only thing I'd interrupt there to add to what Jill's comments are is that actually Jill has done a tremendous amount of heavy lifting on this program. Um, she was in it from the beginning to be responsive as a part of our branch lead for housing and human services and immediately jumped into conversations with um, Q and other folks involved in this effort. And uh, I know she worked over the weekend. I know she was there today um, helping to deliver meals. And so I would say that the county's investment on her part is pretty, uh, uh, I'm very grateful for it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, you, my Jill. pleasure. My pleasure. And you know, I'd really encourage um, the public and they're looking for volunteers and those volunteers are being managed by the United Way. I, I was fortunate enough to volunteer when we were doing it as a school district. And I, I will tell you, it's very rewarding. These families are really needing um, that food insecurity and being able to, um, usually the kids are in the car when uh, they pull up and, and you're giving them meals so you can see right away who it's impacting. And I would encourage um, those who feel safe enough to, to be able to do this to, to find um, time to volunteer or if you can't um, to give money to that I can fund so that we can we can support um, and help so many in our community so um, and, and I just add oh sorry I just wanted to say for folks that if there's if they want to volunteer for this effort and the spots are all full um, I want to make sure that folks can also go and um, sign up to be a volunteer for Just Food as well. There's just as much need there. Um, home, home deliveries are picking up, and um, we provided a lunch to someone today at Liberty Memorial that had just come from, from getting their um, food distribution um, for the week from uh, Just Food, and they indicated that there were at least 150 cars lined up, um, which in a lot... It, to be fair, you know, that is, that's, that's how they're organizing it in this, to promote the social distancing and the order that they have. But the need is real. The supports that are needed through volunteers, there's lots of opportunities between Just Food and um, the school feeding program. Thanks for all your work on that. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jill. And, and commissioners, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd say before you uh, make a motion on this, um, because we don't have any specific dollars coming to us at this point in time that I'm aware of that will, that I can easily access to support projects like this, um, I, my intent is to bring them back to you as a commission and put them on your agenda as rapidly as I can. It may mean that I'm updating the agenda um, you know, the day before, like we did with this item to make sure that it was on there. Um, the city has a little bit more flexibility because of their CDBG program and the knowledge that those funds are coming in regardless of reimbursement. Um, so I, I just, I know there might be some questions as to uh, why we may have some things on our agenda that perhaps um, they're able to handle administratively at the city. 
Um, and I appreciate your flexibility for us, but I wanna be fully transparent as to what the county is uh, potentially committing itself to if federal funds don't come through. Sarah, do you, do you expect any similar asks from other outlying communities? Um, I think Lawrence is sort of unique in that it's stopped food service. Um, do you expect anything like this from Eudora or Baldwin? Do you have any idea on that? So I've, I'm on a call every week with all the uh, school districts and the universities, and that's always our first question is how's feeding going? Um, I would say that if uh, any of those districts get in a position where they have a uh, staff member who is becomes ill, they will likely want to discontinue feeding. Um, and in that case, then we will look to Jill and the team at, um, you know, on that feeding group to figure out how we can try to provide some additional assistance in that community. Um, many of them have, I mean, everybody's kind of doing stuff a little bit differently. I know Eudora and Baldwin are kind of down to two days a week. I think LeCompton is doing some deliveries um, as requested. So I, I think it will kind of depend on each particular community and what would happen in those situations. Um, but, but we, I do think there is potential that, um, another district might, um, not be able to continue for a period of time. Okay. Commissioner Kelly, I'll just, uh, share that, um, one of the things that we're also trying to do with that group, that, um, community feeding group is, um, make sure that we're keeping, that we're getting that group together on, um, they decide a meeting every other week on a Zoom call, which is like 45 people at this point. Um, and it's countywide. Um, it should just keep updating on um, where all the organizations are at in terms of distributions. So I maintain that and I update everybody in um, our work group and our ESF6 group um, and the Unified Command for that matter as well in my updates. But one really great recent development was um, Susan Farley with the K-State Extension Council reached out and offered to, they'd been compiling a list of, a, a more, I think a more comprehensive list of community-wide, county-wide feeding uh, food opportunities, and they're working to get that updated, and then they're gonna share it with um, Carrie Britt so we can have it added um, on and featured on the Coronavirus Hub website. So we're trying to make sure that we have as many opportunities for folks to get food on that Hub website as possible, and. Um, just the extension stepping up this week um, is a great, um, a great um, support of source of assistance for us. I want to make sure I recognize that. So if schools do, if one of those schools does end up having to um, go uh, cease their, their services at one point, you, like Sarah said, I hope that um, we'll hear about it in one either this is the call that Sarah has or the call that calls that I'm having um, because I do have representatives from those districts on um, the calls that I host as well um, but I hope that we're also providing all the backup resources that are available to community members as well through that comprehensive list great thank you Jill it's really great to hear that you're getting that communication so if needs do come up we can we can understand those needs and work together across the community to try to address them. Um, really appreciate that. Well I'll go hey, ahead Jill, and another question. Go ahead. Well just just a real quick one um, kind of tangential. Jill can you and Sarah um, because just food is carrying so much of the load um, right now for feeding, you know, the distribution of the two weeks of food for lots and lots of new families. Do you have a sense of how just food is doing? Are they keeping afloat pretty well at this point? Are they, do you sense the struggle there? Do you, what are you hearing? I think. I mean, I, I try to ch check in with her very frequently. Um, I mean, Liz Kiever and I are texting now, so we're, we're in regular contact and I know uh -huh. Sarah's chatted with her too, but um, she, she says she's good. And what I've asked her is just as soon as she starts to feel 
even a little bit uncertain about anything, um, please let me know. And the one thing she did mention is, you know, she thought they might get at some point low on um, face masks. So um, I kind of preempt preemptively a couple mm. weeks ago put in a resource request through our, our logistics group to get those to her so she doesn't have to wait for anything. But um, yeah, she's, as far as I know, she's, she's just a soldier. She's doing good, but we keep checking yeah. with her. Well, I, yeah, always, but especially now. So thank you so much for, for making that clear to Liz, because I think what we don't want is for, um, for there to be, um, well, for things to get desperate um, or for her to really have to struggle because there's so much other stuff to, to worry about. So I appreciate your keeping in close touch with Liz and, and the Just Food organization. Any other comments or motions or questions? Um, do we have any public on this item? If there's no public comment. There's no. Jill, I don't think is seeing any raised nope. hands there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to make a motion to request. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let me redo this. I'm going to make a motion to provide advanced funding to the Lawrence Education Foundation to support the school age feeding funding program with Lawrence restaurants in the amount of $43,500, which is a 50-50 shared agreement with the city of Lawrence of the 87,000 shortfall to resume meal service beginning Wednesday, April 15th and continuing through May 1st, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Jill. Great work. Uh, I don't think we have any appointments today, commissioners, do we? No. Um, at this time, we take nope. general public comment. I see we have three attendees. Um, is there any general public comment? Or Sarah, anybody there at the courthouse? I don't have anyone at the courthouse. No, I don't either. Okay, thank you. Again, I'm disappointed. Uh, moving on, <laughs> uh, Commissioner and Administrator Miscellaneous, and as is tradition, we'll start with Sarah. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Um, I don't have a lot to report today. I would note that um, we, uh, many of you probably saw that the governor has extended the stay at home orders through uh, May 3rd. Um, we have, uh, we were anticipating that that notice would be coming here pretty soon. From what I understand, she will continue to evaluate uh, the need for the stay at home order based off sort of like two week increments. So I think as we approach uh, closer towards the end of the month, um, you know, I think they will look to how long we extend this. Um, you know, that being said, you know, I think that's the question on everyone's lips is how long are we in this? And, and we're all uh, just waiting and uh, continuing to do what we need to do to continue to flatten the curve. I was real excited to, I think you all saw uh, that uh, yesterday that Carrie Britt shared on our social media that um, cur this was prepared by the University of Kansas um, Institute for Public Policy and Business Research. At least that's the name I used to know them by. I think they have shortened it since then. But um, they prepared showing the five most populous counties in Kansas and uh, how they're doing at managing their curve of cases, of COVID cases since they started having them. And it's incredibly uh, exciting and heart, uh, heartwarming to see how uh, Douglas County has been able to keep a very flat curve in this situation and is um, uh, really, we are doing what we need to be doing. These sacrifices are paying off. Um, our, our rate of spread is, is slowing um, and we're really doing a great job as a community. Um, Unified Command continues to meet every other day to review issues and updates from all of our community partners in this process. Um, I would say that we had a lot of conversation this week about enforcement. 
Uh, we pulled together a team, uh, uh, including our district attorney, Charles Branson, uh, sheriffs, Sheriff Ken McGovern and his team, uh, City of Lawrence, including uh, Chief Burns, and a number, uh, the health department as well, as well as a number of attorneys to uh, prepare a press release that went out yesterday related to enforcement um, of the order. There, we do have measures in place to, um, if folks do not voluntarily comply to, um, to enforce the compliance of the order. Um, it is a class A misdemeanor um, and carries with it a pretty significant fine and potential for jail time. Uh, so I really wanna thank that team for working closely together to prepare something that's easy for officers to use and prepare for. Um, and we had, we had additional conversations about religious gatherings. And, um, you know, I know, I think, you know, we all kind of wait and see how some things go in terms of what the governor's office says in terms of certain comments. But the way we have viewed it now, uh, um, I think is that um, some outdoor services can be allowed um, if they follow certain uh, social distancing guidelines. Um, those are outlined in various governor's orders. So uh, there's communication as to how that can happen. And we've been working closely with uh, members of our community that have asked those questions. Um, and uh, I just stand for any questions the commissioners might have on enforcement or other efforts we're doing related to uh, COVID-19. I don't have any questions. Thanks for the update, Sarah. Out of curiosity, uh, what's the status of the masks that were you ordered last week? I don't have them in yet, but I'm really hoping they get here soon. Um, so I, yeah, I haven't gotten them yet. Um, I, I think we anticipated probably towards the end of the week. But I did want to note that all of our, uh, all of our essential employees that are working with the public at the jail and at juvenile detention have access to masks and they have those right now. This would be just an additional cloth mask for folks to have, um, uh, for all employees to have access to, as well as our volunteer first responders in the unincorporated area. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I would just share with commissioners each Friday, I um, sit in on a phone call for um, county commissioners. They've asked for one from each county. And I give Sarah sort of an update, but I, I think it's important also to sort of share it with the public. Um, some of the things we're hearing, um, they're working really hard to get PPE to us. I, I mean, it's at even so much the state is working hard to engage um, manufacturing plants here in Kansas to see if they can retool um, to provide some of those the, that equipment for us. Um, they're trying to get orders in. I think what I heard last time was that they've ordered 14 million sets of gloves and they've received 1 million. I mean, it's just really hard to come by this, but um, I feel like they really were making assurances that they're trying their best to get these things to us. They've activated the National Guard to deliver it to us. The Corps of Army and uh, the Corps of Engineers is really working hard to, to talk about field hospitals and things like this. I think the one um, pinch point that I really hear is responding, the Department of Labor responding to the number of unemployment requests. Um, and I really want to just encourage the public to hang in there. That website, I think, has been crashing, but I heard today it was going better. Um, clearly, the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce are aware of the challenges that are happening and are doing everything they can to respond to that. Um, and I just really appreciate our governor's leadership. I, I, you know, she steps in on those calls and really is, is, is providing a, a confident and um, thoughtful approach to all of this and sometimes these are very very tough decisions she has to make and and she understands the role that we have counties to play in, in enforcing some of those orders that she puts forward so sarah thanks for working with our enforcement groups to to uh, get those details out to the public 
Any other comments from commissioners? I, I will share just one. I, I mean, I think, Sarah, yes, it is great that we're seeing that curve flatten. We've got to keep working at it. I, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't thank our health care providers. And thank you, Commissioner DeRusso, for all the support that you're doing out there to thank them. That's, you know, the signs we see all over town. Folks, thank Commissioner DeRusso. She's been working hard getting all those delivered. You know, our first responders and and you know our school teachers so many people are working hard across the community right now it is so encouraging our restaurants our grocery store clerks so many people but let's not forget our government um both city county um our school district folks are really working hard and working together um and and thank you to sarah thank you to jill sarah your entire team has really stepped up here and and uh, we, we, you say we're proud of Douglas County, we're proud of Douglas County government, and we're proud of our, our citizens who are doing what needs to be done. Um, and it's hard to do. I mean, it's really hard to do. So I just wanna say thank you to Sarah and your whole team for all the hard work you're putting in to our community for all the work they're doing. I, I appreciate that commissioners. And I, um, I do think that uh, our whole team is learning and, and doing different things and uh, rising to this challenge. And uh, uh, we really appreciate the support of the commission and our community partners uh, uh, in this space. Okay, any other items, commissioners? It's good to see you guys. It is good. <laughs> Just getting together on a regular basis. This is not the same for sure. No, it's it's strange to see Sarah sitting there in the commission room. It, uh... mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's pretty quiet here these days. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had enough time to like paint a backdrop behind us, you know, so that we could. Yeah. Yeah. Just working on that. <laughs> what looks like the commission room. Well, hang in there, everybody. Take care of your families. Take care of yourself, for sure. Um, hang in Thanks, there. Thanks, everybody. All Keep right. up the good work. Yep. Thank you much. Thank you. We are adjourned. Bye-bye.